welcome to our online worship version for Peace Lutheran Fellowship in Port Ludlow. Um, we are very happy that you have joined us um, to gather the ways we, we can online during this time of um, isolation. And we uh, thank you that we can gather this way, and we hope that it is useful and helpful and beneficial to you. Um, today, uh, during our worship, we're going to be talking about the road to Emmaus, and Deacon Cynthia has brought a very um, strong and well done um, dramatic reading that she gives, and then I'll do a little homily afterwards for our message. But um, today, what we're going to talk about a little bit is just how Jesus comes alongside these disciples after a hard time, but he comes alongside us as well, and that the, the reminder today is that Jesus is with us, he has come alongside of us. And he will open our hearts, open our eyes, and burn our hearts with his love and grace. And uh, so let us begin our worship knowing that, that Jesus is with us right here, right now, and will continue to be with us as we journey into our um, new understanding of what things will be like. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ, Christ has risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty, and give us life only you can give. To you be given the honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. O God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent! And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments, and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day, about 3,000 persons were added. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4, 12 through 19. I love the Lord, who has heard my voice, and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from your bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from First Peter. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set upon God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable but imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A retelling of A Walk to Emmaus. Open our eyes. <clears throat> Can you imagine how Joanna and her friends were feeling on that Sunday morning two plus centuries ago? Can you imagine how slowly they must have walked to the tomb where the body of their friend Jesus was waiting for their anointing with spices and oils? 
They couldn't have been too eager to enter that tomb. They never expected that it would be so difficult to be a disciple of that good man whom they had followed around Galilee for three years. They had spent that long Sabbath day in sadness and grief, knowing that they would never see their friend again. <clears throat> it was the Sabbath, and being good Jews, they rested, but they also wept bitter tears, tears of regret for their inability to change the outcome. They wept anguished tears for their loved one had slipped beyond the earth's bounds, yet they knew what they must do. They had to be ready for the morning after the Sabbath had ended, when they could bring something to Jesus for the last time. They could offer a gift to Jesus, preparation of his body with spices and ointments for his final burial. That was definitely for the women to do, women's work sitting with the sick and dying, mopping fevered foreheads, spoon-feeding nourishing broth between parched lips, rubbing spices into lifeless bodies. So Joanna and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James went with the other women to perform that final act of devotion to ready his body for burial Joanna and her friends walked right into the dawn of a new era. Resurrection had broken through the boundaries of death. Death had not held Jesus in its grasp. Joanna, Mary, and Mary Magdalene, and the other women walked into the light of a day like no other day. What a story they had to share with their husbands. What a tale to share with the other followers. Would anyone believe them? And then there were those others trudging the dusty road to Emmaus, walking away from the events of the past three days. Cleophas and his companion and their wives retreating from that experience of seeing their friend accused and sentenced to hang on a lonely cross. They couldn't forget that they were there when Peter had denied knowing Jesus. Now they were thankful that they hadn't been easily recognized as being one of his followers. What would they have said if asked? They were just glad that no one had asked that question. Are you not also one of his followers? They waited all that long, long day, standing at the edge of the crowd as Jesus hung on the cross. They saw the moment when he breathed his last and gave up his spirit. They saw that some others took the body to a place in a secure hillside and watched as the rock was firmly pushed into place. They, too, spent the Sabbath resting, crying for the loss of their leader, the one whom they had believed would redeem Israel. They cried tears of disappointment that they had been duped into believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They cried tears of anger. If Jesus wasn't the Messiah after all, they would now have to wait some more. Would it happen in their lifetime? After a Sabbath rest, Cleophas and his companion, perhaps it was Simon, prepared for a day's journey away from Jerusalem. They didn't want to stay there with the memories of the past three days weighing so heavily on their hearts. Would they ever forget the one who had been with them? teaching them, leading them to look at life in a different way. And yet, he must have been an imposter. Surely, if he were the Son of God, he would have saved himself. But 
today they put aside their disappointment in Jesus to set out on their journey to Emmaus. Out of curiosity, they just had to take a little side trip past the tomb where the body of Jesus had been placed. It wouldn't delay them that much. <clears throat> Before they even reached the tomb, they were practically run over by the women, running as if possessed down the road leading from Joseph of Arimathea's property. It was difficult to understand what all the excitement was about. The women were each trying to talk at the same time. But finally they caught the gist of the story. The body of Jesus was not there. Had someone stolen it? No, the women insisted. Two angels had appeared to them, telling them not to seek the living among the dead. Jesus was not in the tomb. Could his prediction about rising from the dead be true? They ran off to tell the eleven apostles. Cleophas and his companions checked out the tomb of Jesus before resuming their journey to Emmaus. But now they didn't know what to believe. Their view of the world had taken on a different dimension. It had appeared after dying, like a common criminal, that Jesus was just like any other false prophet. It had all seemed so clear. After Jesus had bowed his head and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, he died, just like any other ordinary man. He didn't have any extraordinary power after all. He was defeated by death. Once he had seemed like a shining example of all that was good and true. He had spoken of peace and humility, mercy and forgiveness. What good had it done to talk of forgiveness. Look where it had gotten him, right into the hands of a mob who had been willing to crucify him. They hadn't even been willing to substitute a known criminal to crucify instead of Jesus. Most of all, Jesus had talked about love. Love thy neighbor, he had said, Love those who persecute you. Where had love taken him? It had taken him to the cross. So much for love. Where was love when the nails pierced through his flesh? Where was love when the crowds spat on him? Yes, there was much to talk about that day as they journeyed to Emmaus. And now, just as they were beginning to put the pieces together, this stranger appears. Where on earth had he been that he hadn't even heard about the events of the past three days? Was he deaf? Was he blind? Had he been holed up somewhere? Yes, they could give him the details of the strange events. They could tell him of their disappointment. How they had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. But he obviously wasn't. But then how would they explain to the stranger the emptiness of the tomb? At least they knew that the tale Joanna and Mary and Mary Magdalene and all the other women had told them was not just foolish gossip. After the two groups had nearly collided with one another, Cleophas and his friends had gone to see for themselves. The tomb was empty. 
where had the body of Jesus been taken? They checked the stone. It was enormously heavy. There was no way that it could have dislodged itself from the tomb's opening in the hillside. In fact, the tomb was empty. Only a linen cloth, the special one that is always used to wrap the head, folded and lying all by itself. And there was a pile of the other cloths that were used as shrouds, lying in a heap. Yes, the tomb was definitely empty. This obviously was perplexing. There was no reasonable explanation they could give the stranger. How was it that this stranger, the one who seemed to have not seen or heard anything, how was it that he told them the very things that Jesus had once said to them. That was certainly strange, but stranger still was their reluctance in bidding him farewell. How was it that they were unable to simply say goodbye? Instead, they found themselves saying, Stay with us, for day is done. Stay with us, the night is near. Whatever possessed them to invite a perfect stranger to spend time with them, to eat with them. But, oh, how glad they were that they had extended that invitation. He sat at table with them. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And within each beating heart, recognition dawned he wasn't entombed any longer. He had risen and was there with them again to bless the bread, to bless each of them with eyes that could now see clearly. Their eyes were opened. Their hearts were burning with the flame of love rekindled. What might it take for us to have our eyes opened when we face a tomb, an empty place within us, when we journey on a long, sometimes lonely road that seems to be going nowhere? Do we have resurrection eyes? The tomb, whatever that represents for us, a closed door in our face, the death of a loved one, the loss of health, the loss of a job, how would that tomb be different if we saw it with resurrection eyes? And the long, lonely journey down a road? Whatever that represents for us, a relationship that has ended, a love that hasn't been realized, a hope that has eroded, would that road seem shorter, prove less difficult, be less lonely if we viewed it differently? If we viewed our difficult road differently, what would it be like to travel on that road with Jesus beside us? What would it be like to have our hearts burn within us, recognizing that Jesus is showing us the way? 
Jesus has offered that invitation to us before. He is offering that invitation this day. He is saying, Be not afraid. I go before you always. Will we then beg him to stay with us? Stay with us till night has come. Stay with us till day is done. Make all our weeping wailing end. Stay with us. Heal our eyes. Jesus, take us to the light. Jesus, bring eternal life. Amen. Here ends the Gospel. I was thinking about what to preach this week, um, as, and as we were working on worship, Deacon Cynthia brought this dramatic reading that she did of this trip, this journey on the road to Emmaus. So I thought, what should I preach on that would add to that? And I couldn't think of much. And then I was looking at the other passages in our lessons and in the first reading in the sermon that Peter gives to the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, uh, the sermon, he says one thing that really stucks out. And I think it's something that's timely and it's something that specifically speaks to us today. And it's short, not very sweet, but here it goes. He says this, he says, And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And that's what I wanted to preach on because it seems so fitting for today just to say, come out and say, save yourself from this corrupt generation. But how would we even think of doing that? How do we save ourselves? So I'll just put that one on, on the uh, back burner a little bit. Maybe you'll get to that some other day. But as we look at this uh, our gospel lesson and the story of this trip, this journey to Emmaus, and we look at Luke, we see a lot of the stories in the gospel of Luke involve roads and traveling. A journey brings Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. A road is the setting for the parable of the Good Samaritan. A road leaves the prodigal back home to his father. And in Luke 9, Jesus sets his eyes towards Jerusalem. And the rest of the entire gospel tracks this journey until chapter 19 when he arrives. Scholars call this the travel narrative where in them we find some of the most distinctively Lucan contributions to the story of Jesus, that uh, some of these travel stories are the ones that we get from Luke, and Luke emphasizes this journey. But the roads continue in the book of Acts, which, which Luke wrote as well, where Paul encounters the risen Jesus on his way to Damascus. There is something about travel that evokes Luke's literary and theological imagination. There is something about roads, the way roads bring us together, the way roads can pose a danger to us all, the way roads become a symbol of a faith on the move. In our gospel lesson, we encounter two disciples on the road to Emmaus, which draws us to the conclusion of the third gospel. And on this journey, these disciples, Cleopas and another, and we don't know much about Cleopas, but we know he wasn't one of the 12 apostles. And tradition says he may have been Joseph's brother, Jesus's uncle, and his wife was with the beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus at the cross. Cleopas is on the road here and he's taking or talking to his companion when Jesus just kind of shows up and starts walking with them. And like an episode of the undercover boss, uh, he comes with the wig and the big glue-on mustache and a hat and a Hawaiian shirt so they couldn't recognize him. And he came near them and he asked them, what are you all talking about? What are you all talking about? And Cleopas responds,
Have you been under a rock? Do you not know the things of Jesus of Nazareth? That he was a mighty prophet in word and deed, and that the chief priests and the leaders condemned him to death by crucifixion? And they go on and they say, on top of that, some of those with us went to the tomb and it was empty, and they said they saw these angels and the whole nine yards. But we had hoped that this Jesus of Nazareth was the one to redeem Israel. And these disciples are a lot like us. They have a lot to digest from everything that has taken place up until this point. But they really can't make much sense of what is going on. They're sad, they're grieved, they're scared, and they don't know what the future holds. They are completely unaware that on Easter morning, they woke up to the dawn of a new era, a new reality. And Jesus' response to them is to give them a little admonishment, and then he asked them another question. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? I can see the response being like, uh, I guess so. Then Jesus took them back to confirmation for the rest of the journey and does two of the most Lutheran things possible. First, as they were walking, he interpreted all the scriptures to them about how Jesus, he is the fulfillment of all the law and prophets. And then as they enter the town, they invite Jesus to stay with them with that familiar and beautiful invitation we use to begin holding an evening prayer. And second, as they sat to eat, Jesus turns from being the guest and he assumes once again the position of the host and blesses the bread and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then they went and told the 11 disciples and in this journey we are on, a journey that we don't exactly know the destination or future, perhaps a journey that feels more like the tomb than a road, more like separation and isolation than travel, still Jesus comes near us in word and sacrament like he did Cleopas and his friend. He teaches us so that our hearts burn with affection inside of us at the words of love and grace and reconciliation and peace. He gives you his nourishment in the meal. And through these means of grace, through word and sacrament, he opens your eyes to see him for who he really is. And through this, we are reassured that he is always with us on this journey. And unfortunately, as we're separated, we don't have our sacraments as we normally would. And we can discuss maybe about um, doing that in the future online some way. Um, but make no mistake, every sacrament that you have received is still valid today. It is still with you. And every promise that God has made in that, in the bread and the wine and the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus is still effective today. That those promises placed on you are with you. As we travel our own personal journey, our journey that maybe doesn't take us too far, but someday it will. So dear God, let our hearts burn with fire as we invite Jesus to stay with us this evening and on this journey. Amen? Amen.
Now join us in saying the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and in all places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For those whose hearts are fervent with love for your gospel, that they are empowered to tell the story of your love in their lives and to show hospitality in response to this love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles, prairies, forests, valleys, mountains, and for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, that they are nurtured and protected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For broken systems that we have inherited and that we continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain the nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from the cycles of scarcity and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who call upon your healing name, give rest. Stay with us and walk with all those who are hungry, friendless, despairing, and desiring healing in body and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the faith-forming ministries of this church, for those preparing for baptism, First Communion, Confirmation, and Membership, for those who participate in Sunday School and Adult Education, Guide and inspire learners of every age and ability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make them an abundance, just as you do with our lives. Feed us again at this table for service in your name and strength of the risen Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. <laughs> Gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and, and the, the power, and, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you have fed us with your word, and our hearts burn within us. Through this meal, you have opened us to your presence. Now send us forth to share the gifts of Easter with all in need. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen, just as he said. Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.